There we go. <laughs> so you bob into it. There's a bob, bro. <laughs> so like, my friend came up with this for me. He had a friend of a friend. Yeah, he hooked me up. Nice. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How y'all doing? Welcome back to another episode of Will Called, where your teams, your play, favorite players, your favorite sports are the star. You are the focus of the show. Welcome back to another episode. I'm so excited to be here. Hope you guys had a blessed weekend so far. Great Saturday. I have a very special guest with me, Yusef. What's up, brother? How you doing? How's it going? How's it going? I'm good, Ben. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Like just how... It's like how you liking this uh first and foremost, how you liking this wild card weekend so far? Very 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 interesting. <laughs> I um yeah, you know, as uh as a guy who's a t uh, a fan of the team that got screwed by the Seahawks <laughs> right. to see um to see Brock Purdy embarrass him like that, I'm <sighs> I'm right. rolling, I'm vibing, you know? Right, I'm right. Sure. I, I, can imagine. I, I don't I don't know, it's one of those things where like Wild card weekend is always one of my favorite times of the year mm -hmm. because the teams that really shouldn't have gotten into the playoffs oh. get humbled. Yeah. Do, do I ever do I ever know that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yeah, man, it's uh, it's been good though. It's been good so far. You know. Yeah, and and the thing is, like, I, I'm glad you said that about you know wild card weekend. You know, I always like uh, in sports, just in general, you know, at the professional level, just. When you have one of those one or two teams that haven't made the playoffs in forever, however long it's been, it's a big deal for that team, especially for that fan base. And I always, I always think that's one of my favorite thing of all time about sports. Even though, even though that's not not necessarily my favorite team, doesn't have to be, but just really have that uh, that energy with them. Whether the game goes good or bad for them, is just the fact that they clinched that spot. I remember when the the Lions clinched back in 2011 for the first time in 12 years. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful <laughs> it's a beautiful moment. And, it's, uh, and I, I love watching that team that year, and I will definitely get more into that for sure. But just, just going back, just a flashback for that franchise, you know, very difficult uh, decade in the 2000s. But just, um, yeah, we're definitely going to dive in, into that shortly. Just, um, but, you know, then you have the moments where, like we talked about before we got on, just Jacksonville. This is, oh, I, I don't know you know, what happened. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've seen this video, but uh, there's a clip that was going around TikTok that I found when Jacksonville clinched a division, mm -hmm. and uh, their owner Tony Khan. You see him just like, <laughs> yeah. just like a baby yeah. grabbing yeah. his receivers, like crying his eyes out. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I so I'm also a wrestling fan, and, and I oh, follow awesome. Tony's promotion, All Elite Wrestling, and I know right, right. I know a lot about Tony. I've, I've done a fair bit of research on him and his uh, his family for the last little while, but man, to see that like that glint in his eye of just pure joy, like you can't replicate that anywhere else. Oh, man. It's, it's beautiful. You like because I know just uh, you can only imagine how difficult that is, especially for like what we talk about, just a franchise who's been struggling for for many years. I know they had their peak in the late nineties. They've had some really good teams on the Jack Del Rio in the mid two thousands. Of course, Saxonville in twenty seventeen, but just for yeah. the most part, they just like been a morbid franchise. I was just, you know, Jacksonville was notorious for having like the black tarp in the seats with that logo because yeah. nobody was coming to the game. So, so yeah, so just um, you know, and like you know, they thought they were slick, but I mean, we called it. We called we called wind of it. But just um, man, you know, I don't know if you saw um, during like during the game against um, the Tennessee Titans, the last game of the season where they clinched, uh, they scored, they were trailing, then they scored. Trevor Lawrence threw a touchdown, I think. And uh, it, they, right before that, they showed Sha Khan just sleeping. Like I think yep. it looked like he dozed off. <laughs> yep, just dozed off or something. Like. No, I, don't, I don't know what was going on with that, but it looked like he dozed off. So I know he might tell you something different, but 
You know, just uh, I listen know. to the season. Know. It's um, yeah, it's interesting. It's funny actually. I'm uh, I'm doing a little bit of a deep dive on team owners, oh, and wow, I might yeah. be I'm making a whole video essay about that. Actually, talking about football owners, hockey owners, baseball owners, oh, and the way that. they are with their yeah. teams and how they treat their teams. And Shade Khan is like one of my big studies. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. such an interesting dude. But no, you know, like Jacksonville is one of those teams, man. Like they're in that sort of sub tier of like mediocre mm-hmm. I feel yeah with like unfortunately with the Lions at times right. um where they haven't been taken seriously for a fair bit of time and because of that people sort of write them off whenever the season comes around like right. yeah they're not gonna do it. like I'll, I'll admit it this whole season I wrote Jacksonville off because I was like there's no way they're gonna be that good like okay they have Trevor Lawrence sure but like I didn't think they'd win the division. Yeah, me, me neither. Me neither. You know, they yeah. they caught a lot of people off guard with this season, and I'm yeah. glad they did. I'm glad that we're getting to a point where like these teams that have been bottom of the barrel are finally starting to make their way back up. Yeah, just, and, and it's a beautiful thing to see because uh, you know that's one of the beautiful things about the National Football League just the parity. The parity of mine is just ridiculous. You know, no franchise has repeated since 2003, 2004 when the Patriots did it. With the Patriots, man. So it's like oh. almost 20 years, you know, just yep. – but, you know, in college you see it so so often, especially in the, in the NBA, just – and nothing wrong with that per se, especially if your team is, is the one that's doing the winning. But, but yep. you know, that's the beautiful thing that separates the National Football League for so many years. I know we've had our dynasties in the 70s, 80s, 90s, but, you know – in the last minus, yeah, minus like the Patriots dynasty, there's been right. a fair bit of parity throughout the last yeah. 22, 23 years now in the league. Yes, yeah, and it's, it's a great thing. I just, um, you know, just uh, and like that was that's very fascinating that you brought up just the case study. You know, every time you post a video, please tag me in it. I'm gonna I'm 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 repost it on the top. Trust me, like that is that is a fast. Do you have like a certain title that you want to call it, or are you just like this? case study I'm, I'm not sure yet it's it's just a case study temporarily for for the working title but mm-hmm. um a uh a, a very dear friend of mine from college who is uh my co-host on a hockey podcast we run together oh, wow. him and i for the last two years have been looking into the way owners treat their teams mm-hmm. okay. and um there's this great quote actually from uh a a very well-known GM in the NHL named Brian Burke, Mm -hmm. who has famously worked with some great owners and famously worked with some not so great owners. And one thing he said was uh, these owners are the strangest people on earth because they know how to make their billions of dollars in whatever they do in their business, whether it be, you know, natural gas, retail, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be uh, auto parts in the case of the cons. Yeah. But then they own a team and they become the dumbest people on the planet. <laughs> exactly. And no one can understand why. Yeah. Man. That's the craziest thing. And I look at, you know, I look at the Jerry Joneses of the world. Mm-hmm. I look at the John Henrys of the world who owns the Boston Red Sox. I look yeah. at um <clears throat> I look at like guys like Robert Kraft, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> These men that made their billions and bought a football team or whatever major league sport and some of them do very very well and some of them just for some reason don't know how to manage their money like you're worth a billion something dollars you mm-hmm. did that for 30 years you can't do that again yeah but and like and it just and it is uh once it goes up to the uh, it begs the question like you know do we need football guys as owners you know because like a lot of these guys are football guys and that's so, anyway. so that's that's a really interesting question to ask because uh, I've been looking at with the other leagues, you know, how the owners are, because most of them aren't, you know, most of them aren't basketball guys. Most of them aren't hockey guys. Mm-hmm. Most of them aren't baseball guys, right? Whatever it might be. Um, but you look at like, you know, I think the only, I think the only real example you could look at right now is, to an extent, Michael Jordan, since he owns Charlotte, mm-hmm. right. right? And you can see that Charlotte's running on its own its own game. They're not running Michael's ideas in yeah. Michael's head because I think if everyone's at this point, if you haven't seen The Last Dance, you should probably go watch The Last Dance. It's yes. a great documentary yeah. on Netflix. If there's anything we've all learned about Michael Jordan is that the only person Michael Jordan cares about is Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. and, 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 you know, uh, history serves it, too. Like, 
if people remember that very brief stint where he had, I believe, part ownership of the Washington Wizards in like the 2000s. Yep, sure do. You know, had part ownership and then decided, I'm going to be the GM of the team as well. That didn't go so hot. And then when that didn't go great, he said, you know what? I'm going to play too. Like, Mm -hmm. I think we do eventually need more ex-sport guys to hopefully one day become owners of a team one day if they can make, like, attain that ability or find a financial partner, whatever that might be. Because we need to start realizing that if we're going to have, you know, more parity in the game, if we're going to see more competitiveness in these respective sports, and we kind of need guys that are like that. Yeah, you yeah. can be a billionaire and hire an entire crew of guys. Like, the Lions are my favorite example right now. Because, yeah, like, sure, they, sure. and we'll talk about this later, but I think hiring Dan Campbell was one of the best things they ever did. Oh, the. And a lot of people were skeptical. A lot of people were skeptical. A lot of people, yeah. were. A lot of people were. They I were. Don't, I don't blame them. But Dan Campbell is, and you know, Pat McAfee has talked about this a lot, how Dan Campbell is the most football guy there is. Yes, without question. Like, yeah. that, that man lives and breathes the sport. He, he, he kind of reminds me of like a, a I'm sorry, he kind of reminds me of like a Jim Schwartz, but with the discipline. Like he preaches, yeah, like, he really he's just like, I want to make sure I, I put that in there first. Yeah. 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 I think so. But to, to answer the original question, I think at some point we are going to see a time where we will see more like real you know, football guys becoming either GMs or even potentially team owners in this league, if not maybe in the XFL. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I, think it's, um, I think it would be very beneficial yeah. for that. It's just a matter of time as to when. Yeah, I'm glad you brought the, uh, you know, it's like other you know, pro leagues. It's just, uh, that could be your stomping ground, so to speak. Unless uh, if other owners are willing to do that, just uh, who actually have stake in those teams, if they're willing right. to do that, I think that's a great stopping ground. You know, that's a proven ground. Just you know, it's it's not as long. The season's not as long, so you're not gonna have the same amount of pressure. So I think that's uh, that's a that's a great guinea pig stage for that. You know, just um, and a lot a lot of people need to realize a lot of these owners. Uh, the problem when you have wealth, a lot of times, you know, you're very stuck in your ways. You're very aloof. You know, just uh, condescending, dismissive. Not this, not this stereotype, but just no, to understand. There's a I, lot of guys they just don't get in their own way. They just keep they stay in their own way. I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. they stay it's, in their way. Yeah, yeah, they stay in their way, and they sort of <clears throat> they sort of don't understand where the line is drawn. Yeah, <clears throat> because for them, it's well, I signed your paychecks, therefore I draw the line, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you know, um, my dad isn't a big sports guy, but he's been following more and more football and hockey over the last couple of years mm-hmm. with with COVID and everything. Him and I would watch games together and whatnot. But one thing sure. him and I talk about because he is a a very well known businessman in the Toronto area is look at the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills were I I'm not going to say a laughing stock, but they were definitely in that. You know, like the Jaguars and other teams have been there. They're in that question. gray area of like, hey, are we supposed to be good? We don't know if we're supposed to be good because, you know, the Patriots dominated the AFC East for so many years. Big time. The minute, the Patriots, the minute Tom Brady left was the, I believe, the same offseason where they announced that Terry Pagula was no longer president of football operations and that he was actually going to hire proper football guys to run the Bills. And next thing you know, they're a Super Bowl contender. Yeah, and all it, it took was one offseason. Yeah, and that's what's crazy. It's just like because uh, and kudos to them for you know for hitting on draft picks, hitting on the other off season acquisitions. All that plays a major part. But like you said, it starts at the top. One thing I love about the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, it starts from the top down. Rooney, the Rooney family is an iconic fan football family, so it starts from the top down. It's no coincidence they have six championships. They've had three coaches in fifty years. Yep. Now it's easy to now it's easy now I will say it's easy to stay employed when each of the coaches have been to at least two Super Bowls, but it's easy to stay employed like that. But the fact that they've been patient with these coaches, mm-hmm. and like there was because it's hard for me to believe, but there was a time in the sixties where the Steelers were awful. Oh yeah. But they but they got the right people in there, and yep. they stuck with them. Made the change, and you know, contrary to that, you look at. <laughs> I don't want to bring them up again, but I have to. Yeah. Look at the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> right, right, Look right. Look at the right. Cowboys. Like, right. I, okay, 
I, I, would, I just got off a phone call with um, with a buddy of mine who's from the Dallas area. Yeah. And we were talking about how, you know, every year the Dallas Cowboys fans will always say, it's our year, it's our year, it's our year. Don't worry, next year's our year. This year's <laughs> right. our year. They're like, we swear Dak Prescott's a good quarterback. We swear this is actually going to work. Yeah. It starts at the top, and Jerry Jones refuses to let go of the reins. Oh, I, um, I, have a, I, have a, I have a family friend out here who briefly played in the CFL. Canadian football oh, yeah. and he had gone to or he played football for the University of Colorado Boulder when he was in college right one of his line mates he never told me the name for safety obviously even if I did of course yeah, absolutely. yeah no worries. but he did tell me that his line mate ended up getting drafted by the Dallas Cowboys when they got out of college mm-hmm. and I asked him have you ever met Jerry Jones and like or what what is that interaction like and he said, well, this is what happened. So his line mate, his contract was coming up. He walks into Jones's office and he says, Mr. Jones, Jerry Jones, as you uh, as people may know, is also the general manager of the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, sir. Because the man doesn't, re- he refuses to do anything. He doesn't, <laughs> doesn't. <yeah. laughs> he walks into Jerry Jones's office and says, Mr. Jones, uh, my contract is coming up. I was hoping we could take this time to potentially renegotiate my next contract. Right. Jerry Jones is not listening to him at all as he's asking this. He's just turned around staring at something in his chair. This is apparently how the story goes. Jones turns around in his chair, takes out a sticky note and writes a number down on the sticky note, puts it on the table in front of him. And all Jerry Jones says to him is that or go. Your call. Like, wow. Man, look, Jerry, I know you're spending all your time on your fancy $100 million yacht or whatever, yep. but there is an entire fan base dating back decades of Cowboys fans that are hoping that you are going to do something. And, you know, the one thing I think a lot of sports fans in general, if you follow both hockey and football, compare the Dallas Cowboys to the Toronto Maple Leafs. They haven't seen a Stanley Cup since 1967, Yes, and it's been the same thing, just poor ownership, not knowing what to do with the team. They've built up an incredible roster, but it's like they just can't get over the hump. And I don't think it's necessarily the player's fault. It's something to do with management more so like, look, we're in this to make money. We kind of don't care if you win a Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. However, no, and and my last point is, however, Super Bowl equals more money. (laughs) <laughs> it, like it, it, and you would think as a multi-billionaire that he is, he would understand that as long as he's been right. in the. And the thing is, you know, and what people need to realize about the Cowboys, they was was crazy is that they drafted so well over the last ten plus years. They drafted it's unbelievable. Drafting they, they, so on their player, the player develop is unbelievable. <laughs> like the way they built their offensive line, Ty- Tyron Smith, uh, Zach Martin, Travis, like they built they that through the draft. draft. My favorite O lines in the whole league, and yet again, like what's what's going on? And it's, and it's the thing is, and like um, you know, just there was a time where he was focused primarily on winning. I remember when he was. I remember seeing a video of the America's Game, you know, the docu series on uh, NFL Network when they did the '92 Cowboys. When Jerry Jones became the owner in 1989, he was saying that you know, you know, we'll, winning is the only option. We will win. Just like it was, there's no option. And like he got the clean out, clean house, got in. He when he fired Tom Landry, he got rid of Tom Landry. You know, very unpopular move at the time from the fan base. Got rid of Herschel Walker in the trade, the epic trade. Two two very unpopular moves, but he was committed to changing that franchise around, which he did, much to his credit. But like he he let his ego get in the way. He I think he was insecure of Jimmy Johnson and the credit that he got. And yeah. like I mean, because he set down the foundation as well. Because yes, you, you guys drafted unbelievable well, you know, he did great in the offseason. But he, he like Jimmy Johnson had that that forceful nature to him. It's oh, like yeah. he, he stayed on players. Like he had a, the, the team had an edge yeah. when he was the coach. And you know, they were still good with Barry Switzer, but he didn't have that edge. You know, now to be fair to Barry, that's when the team got older, but they were still highly productive. And but it's it, but it was a difference. It was a clear difference. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's you know, it's it's a night and day kind of thing, where when ownership understands what their job is in the greater scheme of things, mm-hmm. then you start to see teams flourish a lot more. We're seeing that with the Bills. 
we're starting to see that more with the Jaguars. We're seeing that with the Lions. Yeah, yeah. Nine and eight in Dan Campbell's second season because the Fords finally decided they weren't going to have full control over the team anymore. And voila, voila. You know, you look at uh, people. People will hate on him, and that's fine. He's, you know, one of my idols as a head coach. But if there's a reason the Patriots did so well for twenty years. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's a huge reason. And and the thing is, uh, and another team we didn't talk about was the 49ers. You know, there's uh oh, obviously man. obviously uh historically successful, so that does help. But you have a an off you have a, a front office that's all in line for the same goal. And uh one of my one of my guys, he actually asked you in the comments, uh, he said, uh, what did the 49ers do with Trey Lance? Because I mean they this is a very compelling question, you know, for this offseason. So, I have two thoughts on this. One of them is actually really funny because I just saw um, a report on this not maybe about an hour and a half ago. Mm-hmm. First things first, you still have Jimmy Garoppolo. What are you gonna like? What are they gonna do with Jimmy? Jimmy? <laughs> That's why. I was, yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah. look, I get. No offense to Brock Purdy, <laughs> I think considering he was Mister Irre- Irrelevant and now just. Won a playoff game with the 49ers. Yep. He looked he look, he sure. look good. Give him, give him his faith, you know. Give him that hope. Let him, let him cook and see how he rolls, you know. The thing is with Trey Lance, I think Trey has the potential to be a. I'm not going to say an elite quarterback because I don't want to get expectations too high. I'm going to say a stud quarterback. Right. But they need a little. They need proper time for Trey to grow. You know, it's. Yeah. It's one thing to have a, a stud prospect quarterback like that and feed him to the wolves directly. And sometimes you get results you want. Sometimes you're not going to get the results you want. And for some reason, this is something I realize is when they don't get the results they want, the coaching, the fan base, everyone will go after that one guy. Like, it's not entirely his fault, you know? Not at all. Like, we, we've seen that with the Jets and Zach Wilson this year. Every time he's been benched, we've seen that with Mac Jones and the Patriots this year. It's not that he's bad. It's just you know, they're still green. Yeah, and just been here a exactly. And, and but Trey, like, yeah. Sorry. Um, you going, what going. I was gonna say is Trey is one of those players where I think if the 49ers give him a chance and trade off Jimmy G, give Trey at least half the season next year, assuming he's mm-hmm. healthy. Yes, that's one big thing. Assuming he's healthy, give Trey the season. Um, the other thing, and this is something I saw that I, I kind of chuckled at, but there's a rumor. I don't know how sure it is, but there is a potential rumor that the Lions are willing to trade the 81st pick in this year's draft for Trey. Are you serious? Apparently. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm i not going to lie. I wouldn't, if Trey's healthy. Yeah, if, yeah like, yeah, I mean, it's, Harris, that's, like, that'd be a nice gift for them. It just, yeah. And for the 81st overall pick, like, for a guy that was a first-rounder not two years ago? Yeah, this You know, that's it's insane, idea. yeah. I think I think Trey's got time. It's just the 49ers need to give him time. I, 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 I agree, 100%. Because you know, I feel like uh, the last few years, maybe dating back to, like, the early 2010s, they've been in, the, they've been in a situation where they've had a guy – but they don't know if he's the yeah. guy. You know, you date back to the last Super Bowl appearance when they had Cap. Yeah, right. right? Colin yeah. Kaepernick was a guy. Was he the guy? Yeah. Yes and no. You can argue both depending on what side you look at, right? Uh, they trade for Jimmy Garoppolo. Was Jimmy G the guy? No, but he was a guy. And Jimmy G got hurt a bunch. Then they drafted Trey Lance. Has Trey Lance been the guy? Not yet. He's been a guy. And now you have Brock Purdy, who is a guy. Yes. That's, you know, I think that's, the, that's the only thing with the 49ers is they have to – the 49ers need a little more patience when it comes to their quarterback game. And if they stick to one thing and just sit with it for a while, maybe we'll start to see a little more progression in the way the 49ers are working. Yeah, I think it, the uh, patience is definitely the key. I, I like what he did in college. I know it's at a, I know it's a different level of competition, yeah. but you know, just uh, but 
he has a lot of promise. You know, you have a you have a historically great franchise who is really great from the top down historically. So you have a you have a you have a dominant uh, offensive coach, you know, who really gets the most out of his quarterbacks. I just think he just needs the time. I, I think uh, you know, just you get a lot for Jimmy G in a trade this off season, and oh, then you yeah, just you build get, off. You get money like, for Jimmy G. Yeah, just uh, it, like you just build from there. Obviously, the health is the. I always say, you know, the greatest ability you have is your availability. So it's ultimately going to come down to him being on the field. But just, uh, oh, but he yeah, does absolutely. have a tremendous amount of promise, and uh, I definitely think um, he would he would bode well with that. With that, you know, with that uh, situation in the Bay, it'll bode well for him tremendously. And speaking of promise, you know, uh, I know your lines have a lot of promise. So that this 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 is what I really want to talk about too. Here we go. Uh, I know, like you, you know, what were your thoughts about when they beat the the Packers in the finale? Oh my God, I was so happy. <laughs> so, Our so drive, my, yeah. Um, so, so uh, just a little about me while we're while we're here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm a professional musician by by occupation. Awesome. So awesome. I travel a lot around the United States and around Canada for shows and for work and whatnot. Yeah. And um, the night of that game, I was flying back from a gig in DC. Okay. So I texted my cousin and I was like, I need your NFL network login now <laughs> because I need to watch this game. And he understood because he's, he's back out in Michigan. Yeah. So I was like, I need it right now because this, like, you know how important this game is to us, right? <laughs> I don't care that the Seahawks beat the Rams and that the Lions aren't making the playoffs. All I care about right now is that we beat Aaron Rodgers. Hey, listen, come on. So, Absolutely. you know, I'm sitting in D.C. airport watching just the pregame, just getting ready for it. By the time I landed in Toronto, it was just at halftime. And I'm like, come on, come <laughs> on, you know. But to see them pull that victory and take down Aaron Rodgers like that at Lambeau. Oh, such a statement, such a powerful oh, statement. Absolute statement, you know. And, man, credit where credit's due. God, it's been so good to see this Lions team flourishing with all their rookies, seeing, you know, and oh, even just the, the yeah. new guys, the bright stars. Like, Aiden Hutchinson and James Houston are oh, terrifying. Yes, yes, terrifying yes. on the defensive line. Uh, yes. You know, not necessarily in the Packers game, but throughout the season, Amon Ross St. Brown has been – the sleeper wide receiver. Like, oh, receiver so under like, Yes, so under it, yes. Jamal Williams, man, as our number one running back. Yeah. Like, I, I couldn't be more happy to see how the Lions are now. And genuinely, I had a moment of like, yeah, I know we're not making the playoffs, but we have a winning season and we beat the Packers. But yeah. I can't complain, man. On, on national television. On, on Sunday Night yes. Football, on Friday. Big deal. Big deal. Couldn't ask for anything better. And like just uh and I know um you know getting to the playoffs is always ideal. Uh, just um but they just have so much promise. You know, I was really impressed with Jared Goff this off this season. Oh, really man. have such a powerful resurgence. He made Geno Smith too. I mean, just comeback player of the year is gonna be a very interesting race, but Jared Goff has been awesome this season. Jared Goff is a guy who he has intrigued me ever since he got to the league. Yeah. Because being the first overall pick that he was, I think the thing, not just in football, but in most sports, except maybe baseball, because baseball is just all over the place. Mm -hmm. When you're picked first overall, the amount of expectation that is on your shoulders as a player, is, it's enormous. Yes. It's so much and now, you know, to be fair, with the NFL, yeah, because players mainly, you know, any prospect would go through the NCAA first. So they're not getting drafted till they're like 20, 21, 22, right. maybe, right? So they've got some time to mature before they understand what they're about to deal with. Jared, coming into the league when he was still on the, on the Rams, was one of those things where I thought he's definitely got it, mm -hmm. but you yeah. can tell there's some inconsistencies to his game. Now, to be fair, did he pull that team on his back and drag him to that Super Bowl in 2019? Yes. Yeah. Um, was it his fault they lost? No. 
it was one of the lowest scoring Super Bowls in history. The Patriots won thirteen to three, man. Like. What? Yeah, just uh, like, not, and not to that's weird. much to my surprise, uh, just but you know that's the masterful, masterful mind of uh, you know Bill Belichick defensively. Oh yeah, oh yeah, defensively. And, that's, uh, and I think right, yeah, I think offensively you can't play golf. But when the trade happened, um, it was one of those things where I sort of stared at it for a while. I had to, I had to take like a day or two to think on it. Right, and um. You know, will he be good? Will he not be good? Will he be inconsistent? Will he be this? Well, you know, you're trading for Jared Goff, who's coming into a brand new team, brand new culture, brand new system. And that same year is when we got, you know, Brad Holmes is the one that made that trade. Yes. This is for, that's his first massive move as GM of the Lions. You know, we hired Dan Campbell. It's a new, it's entirely new culture. In right. this brand new environment that Jared Goff is in. And while his first season wasn't great, I will admit that. This is where I think the inconsistency thing comes into play. This year? The lights out, man. The first half of the season, I think, was just them getting, you know... Here, the craziest thing about the Lions this year is I think only two games or three games this whole season we got crushed. We got yeah. shut out by the Patriots. We got the snot kicked out of us by the Carolina Panthers. Mm-hmm. And... There was, I cannot remember the third game, but every other game we've had has been close, right? We only lost by a field goal to Buffalo on Thanksgiving. Uh, oh, that was, that was a great that game. Stings. That, that was a great stings. game. I knew, I knew um, it did. Because they, yeah, they had so much awesome. momentum in that, but, in that game. Jared, for everything that's happened, I think with the receiving core that he has now, for how Detroit is trying to build – this just gigantic juggernaut of we are going to eat you. Yes. You know, with guys like Panay Sewell. Yeah, I think Goff has clicked a lot more. And actually, um, there's a, a stat I found on Twitter uh, a couple days ago where the last nine games of the season for Jared, <clears throat> 68% completion rate, 2,397 yards, 15 touchdowns, zero interceptions, oh. seven and two record. Like, it is, this, you can't put that on him. No. You can't this year, that. he finished sixth in total passing yards with forty with 4,400 passing yards, fifth in touchdown passes, 29 on the season, and second in interception percentage, only 1.2 interceptions on the season. <laughs> this is, I think, the best Jared Goff has played other than that 2018-2019 season. 2018, oh, he was unreal. Like, was unreal. With him. Yes. But, like, this is absolutely, like, the most lights out he's played despite that very rocky first start to the yeah. first half of our season this year. Man, I you know, I, I tell my friends this all the time. And for a lot of my friends that call me being like, you sure Goff is still, like, the guy? I don't think he's the guy. Mm -mm. No, Goff is the guy. Yes, yeah. Jared Goff is now the guy in Detroit. Yeah, they 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 can definitely beef up that defense. Oh, yeah. 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 If they can can start beefing up the defense a little more, you know, injuries aren't as much of a thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, we went 9-8 and this season. Don't be shocked if we make the playoffs next year. I would be, just like, because – I'm not sure what Green Bay is going to do. You know, Aaron Rodgers, you know, the escapades in the offseason. And, the the shenanigans. Know, just like, he might be retiring. He might not be retiring. Like, it's like Brett Favre 2.0, basically. Oh, I'm <laughs> well, You know what? You think Aaron Rodgers, I think despite all of his um, literal insanity, that's the word I'm going to use. Uh, I like that. Yeah, we can do that. I still have, I still have some respect for him. As a football player, man's done everything you can. Oh yeah, he's in the game of football. He, you know, he's got the Super Bowl. He's got the MVP, four-time MVP, regular season. Yeah. Like, what else does he have to do? I don't blame him. So you know, um, I don't know if you caught this, but at the end of that Green Bay Detroit game, uh, Jamal Williams actually went up to Aaron Rodgers and asked if they could do a jersey swap. You know, last game of the season, it'd be cool mm-hmm. to have Aaron Rodgers jersey. And Rodgers in the most polite way possible, uh, told JMO, uh, no, I think I think I'm gonna keep this one for <clears throat> for a sentimental purpose. Mm. And his post game interview, you know, he talked about you can only ride the carousel for so long until you finally have to realize you gotta get off at some point. 
And I think this is where we see the end of Aaron Rodgers. Uh, you know, I think this is finally where he walks off into the sunset with or without his vaccines. It just, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, overall, I think just looking at how everything was for the Lions this season, I couldn't ask for a, beckon, a better second season under the new regime. Yeah, You know, for all the people that were doubting Dan Campbell as a head coach, because a lot of people, very fair to assume, but also I'm going to stand up for my man. You know, a lot of people looked at Dan Campbell like he was just a motivational preacher that oh. couldn't leave that team nothing. And like, right. man, you're, I would take a bullet for Dan Campbell, okay? Yes, I, yeah. There are days I yeah. cry when I watch that man at a post-game press conference. I, I will take a bullet for Dan the first half of the season, a lot of people had already written off Dan Campbell. They were saying, fire him. They were saying, he's not yep. worth it. You know, it's only been a year and a half, but they're like, no, nope, he's not the guy. He's not the guy. He's not the guy. When that winning streak started in the latter half of the season, when we went four and zero, everyone shut up. And I'm like, good. Put some respect on that man's name. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, Campbell. such Dan a great fun. does not give up. Does he make some questionable calls in the fourth quarter? Yes, he does. But besides that, lights out. Every game we've had, other than those three I mentioned earlier, have been very close for the Lions. We could have beaten Buffalo. We could have beaten Carolina. We could have done all this, right? Dan Campbell truly has that dog in him. Yes, indeed. And that dog is jacked up on, like, three extra large cups of coffee. (laughs) Keurig, baby. (laughs) <laughs> but I genuinely believe that Dan Campbell coming to Detroit has been one of my favorite things I've seen since, you know, since Jim Cadwell. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. And, even, and even then, I think, uh, you know, Jim Cadwell had the respect of the players. But the biggest difference with Dan Campbell is that MCDC not only has the players believing in the culture of the Lions, he's got mm-hmm. them believing in management, He's got them believing in themselves. And I think that's something that's been missing for so long. Because, you know, you mentioned earlier the 2011 Lions. Yeah. You know, the heyday, the Matthew Stafford and Megatron days, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. What did we have to believe in back then? We could only really believe in Matthew Stafford and Calvin Johnson. Yeah. You couldn't really believe in anything else. But, you know, Dan Campbell has every member of this Lions team believing in themselves that they can do it. That we can get over that hump, and we did. We went three thirteen and one for his first year, nine and eight. It's still a winning record. Yeah, and like, yeah. and I and I'll say this: in nineteen eighty nine, before the Cowboys won their Super Bowls in the nineties, nineteen eighty nine, it was Troy Aikman's rookie season. I think um, it was Mike Irvin's like second season in the league. Yeah, they went one and fifteen. Yeah. And they, they drafted him and Smith uh, ninety, and uh, they went seven and nine. 1991, they got knocked out in the second round, and you know the rest is history. The second, the next oh, year. So, not to say they're going to be the, the Dallas Cowboys in the 90s, but you know that's they have a lot of promise. But just, um, yeah. but I wanted to ask you one more question. Well, I, I want to say this: uh, going back to the 2011 team, just like I said earlier about Jim Swartz, really fiery guy. Just it, it was. It, I was. I remember when they beat Chicago on Monday night. Just uh, it was they were really dominant that year, offensively speaking. Just uh, but but just like when you see that team throughout the year, they just were so undisciplined. And like, and I always say, yeah. and I would say that because like, and I'm careful with this because I know uh, the thing about a fiery coach like Jim Swartz, it's I like it for like a team that has struggled for a long time because uh, you know they get that edge. But uh, but the thing it only works if you win consistently, and he didn't ultimately right. do that. Yeah. It just, um, yeah, I think, but just when you have Dan Campbell, I know it's still very, it's still young in his tenure, but you know, just I, I'm excited for how that franchise is moving. But uh, do you, oh, yeah. do you, um, do you think Ben Johnson's staying? Oh God, I hope he does. <laughs> I really hope. I yeah. really hope Ben has one more year and then becomes the head coach somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Just not, just not now. Yeah. Now, not now would be great and they're like perfectly ideal. You know. Um, you know what, like, for everything that Ben Johnson, um, Aaron Glenn, and Deuce Staley have been doing to that team, it doesn't shock me that, you know, teams are 
now asking about Ben Johnson to potentially mm-hmm. become a head coach. Right. But I feel like I, I feel like he knows that his job's not mm-hmm. done in Detroit yet. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Like maybe one more season to just really push that boundary. See how it goes. And like you keep saying, it's just the fact that, you know, they, the foundation that they're building is yeah. so strong. Um, like I said, it's still, I know it's early. It's still early. Yeah. But That's just so uh, early. It's only two years in. But, but just, uh, but yeah, it starts, it starts at the foundation, you know, at, but, yeah, but what, you know, if, if the top is right, it's going to come trickle down. It right. always does in the National Football League. And you know what? I've been, I've been a Lions fan for a, a fair bit of time. And I've just been a, a Detroit sports fan for a long time since I have family out there. But, you know, for all the years that Martha Ford was running the team mm-hmm. as owner, you could tell there was still a little bit of pushback and, and whatnot from ownership wanting to get things done. You know, we went 11-5 and five in Jim Campbell's first year as head coach. And then we lost the Cowboys in a game that I would like to completely forget <laughs> and never think about again. Right, that right, was right. not a touchdown, but you know what? Yeah. That's okay. I'm not yeah, I, agree, I agree, yeah. Um, I agree. But I think when Martha Ford finally stepped down, to be fair, she's like 90-something years old. Mm-hmm. But when Martha Ford finally stepped down in ownership went to Sheila Ford, um, I don't know if you've if you've watched these, but if you ever get the time, check out the the inside the den videos that the Detroit Lions YouTube channel does. I, I've seen those from time to time. Yeah, yeah. The mini doc, like the mini yeah. documentaries that they've been doing. Mm-hmm. There's you know there's there's a legitimate relationship between <clears throat> Sheila Ford and the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's not a football person. We all know right. that, you know. But you can tell there's a genuine interest in wanting the team to become better. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's such a, that, that's such an important element. Yeah, and yeah. like like we said, <clears throat> it's all about foundation. And for the Lions to have made that foundational change so quickly and acknowledge that they needed to make it, and it's already made such a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, only the future. You know, we we don't know what the future holds for us, but it. It's getting brighter and brighter every single day for the Lions. Yeah, just, I, I'm excited for you. I'm really excited for you. Just especially with the, the Rocky NFC North, anything can happen with oh, that. Oh yeah. But I want to get to now the, like the main event, brother. Your Red Wings. Oh, <laughs> we got it. We got. We got to. We got to talk about them. We had to talk about them. I want to start uh, off by saying, so, um, I know just. Um, it, it's interesting. You told me um, before we got on. You know, early this week, just. About uh, you had talked about, and we're gonna get into more detail in this few minutes. Uh, just sure. about the tanking, just uh, and I and I had to say, like, so you said we're tanking, really. So because I know when you when you look at the historical lens, you know, any casual fan of sports, when they think about the Detroit Red Wings, that the team and tanking doesn't really go together historically. No, it doesn't. So no, it's just like I was like, I, I had to make sure I read it right in the message. I know, like, I know, uh, fortunately, right. the team has missed like. <laughs> <laughs> missed the playoff six years in a row, unfortunately. Oh, it's been Not... longer than that at this point. I think I can't even keep track. I think it's been six years, but man, I don't remember anymore. I will say this. Since this since we saved this for last, I get to have some fun here. Um, cool. I so like I said, I'm, I've been very invested in Detroit sports for a long time because of you know my family relationship with the city of Detroit and with yeah. the state of Michigan. I've been a Lions fan for about eight, nine years, I guess, dating right, like, the end of the Jim Schwartz era, heading into the Jim Cadwell era. Um, I've been a Tigers fan for a long time. I've been an on-and-off Pistons fan. But where everything started for me, not just with hockey, but with sports in general, Mm -hmm. was the Detroit Red Wings. They are my favorite sports team of all time. They're my favorite hockey team of all time. I will... I will do anything to defend the Detroit Red Wings. Hey, I respect. Even I respect if you. that means admitting that tanking might be a good idea. Hey, I'd just it's about because, the future, you know. You know, man. So I'm I'm 27, and mm-hmm. when I was growing up, I was two or two or three or two years old. Two or three years old when they won the back to backs in ninety seven, ninety eight. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know the the Russian five years, the the, the dominating years. Yes. Um, oh, yes. I remember being 
young enough to not know what was going on, but old enough to remember what had happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Nick Lidstrom launches a beautiful goal from the blue line of the 2002 oh. playoffs. Like, they, one of the greatest oh, two-way players ever, by the way. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, you know, the 2002 Red Wings crushing everyone in their sights. Yes. En route. They were not losing that playoff at all. They they had to win the Stanley Cup or it was a fluke. Um, I remember watching them win the Cup in 2008. I remember mm -hmm. every journey they've been on growing up as a Red Wings fan. And yeah, it's true. It's not really synonymous with tanking. The history of that franchise, mm -hmm. if you don't count the Dead Wings era of like the 70s, the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. but the pre, you know, the post Gordy Howe years. Yeah. Besides that, it's been nothing but excellence in Detroit, and we've held ourselves to that for decades and decades. Yeah. However, um, I think with how the team is now, and in, in no part to just how the league has been, a lot of it, unfortunately, did sort of revolve, actually, ironically, around the history of yeah. the Red Wings and with Ken Holland when he was still GM was part of the reason why we ended up in this mess was Ken Holland gave up everything and anything he could traffic wise to try and keep that team going because we wanted to keep the playoff streak alive. Right, right. You know, historical 25, 26 years straight in the playoffs. Un man, it's uncanny. You're just un unheard of, man. And, you know, we look at those sacrifices that Ken Holland made then. And at the time, we look at it and go, okay, well, he's, you know, he's trying to keep this team built. You know, we're trading random players to get Daniel Alfredson, David Leguan, Stephen Weiss. Oh, that one really weird year where Mike Medano was a Red Wing. Like, yeah, that one. Know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we didn't realize what the long-term effect of that was going to be, you know? Trading for I, this stings. This every time this gets mentioned to me, I tell them, I tell people to just shush, because this still stings in my heart. <clears throat> Ken Holland famously traded off Detroit's first round pick, and a second, I believe it was, to get Kyle Quincy from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Right, that yeah. first round pick ended up becoming Andre Vasilevsky. You know the greatest goaltender in the world. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course it did. Yes, of course it did. You know? But after Ken Holland stepped down and then left in 2019, and Steve Eiserman came back, it was um, <clears throat> it was a time where we, we knew we weren't going to be good immediately. We had promising young players, Tyler Bertuzzi, Anthony Mantha, Dylan Larkin, mm -hmm. you know, but we didn't entirely know what the plan was long-term. We just know, everyone knows in Detroit, you trust Steve Eichert. Yes. That's how it rolls. You know, f stupid fun fact for you, actually. Uh, is it still up there? It is. I have a signed photo of Steve that oh. hangs up right in front of my bed, and every morning I wake up and that's the first thing I see. Excellent. That is how much that man means to us, you know. I, I, I mean, icon, you know, just, oh, he, yeah. he's a short list. I mean, the short list of the icon, the Mount Rushmore player, short list. Oh, yeah. Very oh, short yeah. list. But, you know, so um, the, re the reason I sort of say we're sitting on us tanking is since Steve took over in 2019, we have, if you look at mainly first round draft picks, we got more Cider in 2019, sixth overall. 2020 was the year we got Lucas Raymond. 2021, we got Simon Edvinson, first round. Lucas Raymond got fourth overall. Simon, we got sixth, I believe, as well. Sixth or eighth. I can't remember, actually. And then this year, this last year, we got Marco Casper and Sebastian Kosa. But, you know, Steve has been trying to build this team that will eventually be good. Yeah. We don't know when eventually is. It's hockey. Hockey is like the greatest roll dice and see what you get sport ever, mm -hmm. besides baseball, right? So part of why I don't mind the tanking is, number one, the Red Wings, despite Steve spending a lot in free agency this year to 
bolster up the team to potentially be like a fringe playoff contender, not do anything in the playoffs, at least just try to make the playoffs. Right. Was one thing, but I think with the way the season has gone and the way injuries have just messed us up entirely, um, tanking doesn't seem like a bad idea. Because if, for for anyone in, in, the, in the comments that might that follow hockey, or at least to the extent that I do, um, there's a lot of really good kids in this draft coming up in 2023. Yeah. You know, we, we mentioned that earlier this week when, when you were texting about it. But, you know, you have, there's this kid out in Russia, plays for the KHL for, I believe he plays for St. Petersburg right now, named Matvey Michkov. And this kid is yep. supposed to be, you know, once in a generation talent. Uh, Adam Fantley, who's currently, I believe, now playing for the University of Michigan, just played on the U.S. national team for the World Juniors. Big time, uh, he yeah. is also on the U.S. NTDP. Yeah, him. And then there's Connor Bedard, who I genuinely, from watching him play, I think this kid is going to be a freak of nature, like a Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid type player in the league. When he oh, shows. that's 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 a nice, that's an eye opening um, eye opening comp right there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. This yeah. this kid, and I'm calling him a kid because uh, yeah, he's 17, obviously. Oh yeah, yeah. but you know, he's five foot nine. A hundred and I think like eighty five or one hundred and ninety five pounds. He's a lightweight. This kid's scrawny, but he's strong. He's not like he hits hard despite being you know five six inches shorter than most of his like, counterparts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, most of his counterparts. His skating is on levels. The only thing he's missing is the speed that McDavid has because McDavid's just a freak of nature. But the way Connor Bedard sees the ice, the way he can maneuver through an entire D line, is just like, how are you doing that? He has one of the wildest wrist shots I've ever seen. He's got seventy points right now in junior in twenty nine games. Wow. Yeah, screw it, tanking. I don't mind the tanking this year because Detroit will eventually be good. I absolutely believe that. You know, like I said, Dylan Larkin, Tyler Bertuzzi are still growing. Dylan Larkin being the captain of the team now, right? He's grown not only as a player, but as a mature human being, having the captaincy of one of the most historic franchises in hockey. Yeah. You know, Moritz Sider is already proving that he is going to be a top five defenseman one day in this league. That kid's good. Simon Edvinson taking his time in Sweden to grow and taking his time in Grand Rapids on the A to grow. Yeah. Um, Marco Casper is out in Sweden right now getting ready. Sebastian Costa is getting ready. Steve Eiserman is building this team of essentially terrifyingly tall and strong children that will eventually <laughs> grow up to be even taller and far more terrifying children. <laughs> I see that, yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and I think just going, you know, talking about what we talked about earlier with, you know, with the 49ers is patience is such a big thing. Yeah. And many patience people don't is, have it. It's such a huge thing. thing. Yeah. And with the it. Red Wings, like, hey, man, you know what? I got most of my life, they were in the playoffs. And, and, and I got to, exactly. And I got to enjoy. Okay. So this is, this is something I bring up as a joke all the time because yeah. Toronto Maple Leafs fans will never shut up. <laughs> um, then because I live right outside the city, I don't ever get the brunt of it, or I always get the brunt of it, rather. Right. But Leafs fans will always be like, oh, well, our team's better than the Detroit Red Wings because look at us, we're in the playoffs. And I will always give them the same argument. I go, that is good for you. First things first, win a playoff round. That's important. Second thing, to to second thing I have seen four Stanley Cup wins in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah I just tell them, just tell them, count to four. Yeah, count the four. Count the four. <laughs> I've seen four Stanley Cup wins in my lifetime. Okay. Count the 97, four. Ni- 97, 98, Mike Vernon won MVP in 97. Steve Eisman won MVP in 98. 2002, the year Nicholas Lidstrom won MVP when they beat the Carolina Hurricanes in five games. 2008, the year Henrik Zetterberg won MVP when they beat the Penguins. Yeah. I've seen four Stanley Cups in my lifetime, man. That's a blessing. I'm proud of this team. Yeah. Despite how they've been the last couple of years, and and like and I'm glad you and I'm I'm glad you brought that up because um, like we talked about Eiserman, just you know if if I trust any franchise in hockey to rebound, it's going to be Detroit. Like just rebound from a tough area, like because you know we were talking about you know that coaches you know missed six straight seasons, uh, missed the postseason six straight years, 
after having like the the three consecutive first round exits, you know, from Babcock to Blashill, you know, just like what were your thoughts of those, you know, Babcock and Blashill, just real quick? Like, was it just management that gave him a hard time, or just they just didn't really click on the ice for the team? I know you said make this quick, but I actually have to think about this one for a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, I will say this. I think despite everything that happened with him and the Toronto Maple Leafs, Mike Babcock is still one of my favorite coaches of all time. Mm-hmm. I think for what that man brought to the league and what, you know, he got to stay on the cup of Detroit. I'm not complaining. But um, okay, I'll say this. I think I remember – when they announced that Jeff Blasher was going to be the new coach yeah. of the Red Wings. And my thought process was, okay, well, he coached the Griffins, and a lot of the guys on the team were on the Griffins when he coached them. So maybe that might work. We don't know. Well, only one way to find out, right? Um, did it work? No. Mm-hmm. That's fine. But I think the thing is, is... Blash Hill had his way of doing things, and Mike Babcock is very stern about the way he runs a team. You know, and yeah. Babs made it clear when he ran that team. The other thing, I will admit, like, I think part of it has to do with management. I think Ken Holland had far too much faith in a very, what was a very uh, aging team. Aging in the sense that, you know, the history was starting to age, not so much the players. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he said, she said. Um, Ken Holland, I think, had a little too much faith in Jeff Blashill in that he trusted a man who just had his head coaching debut in the professionals. Mm. Again, he was head coaching GR, but this is his first time coaching the big boys, right? Right, right. You know, to trust him with that responsibility with a team that just wasn't able to bring that same flair anymore. You know, I remember when Nick Lidstrom retired. That was the day I knew things were going to start to go downhill. I just didn't know how fast. Right. You know, when Henrik Zetterberg finally called it quits, I remember, you know, being like, okay, this is where it really starts to decline. When Pavel Datsuk, not retired, but left to go play in Russia, yeah, you know, but um, I think the switch between Blashill and uh, or Babcock to Blashill was one of those things where we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into, mm-hmm. and the only thing we could do is pray and see what happens. Right. You know, and it was what it was. Blashill did his time, and with the right move of him being let go during the off season rather than him being fired mid season. Yeah, I prefer that. Yeah. And now we have Derek alone. And I'm, I like Derek, you know, it's only his first season. But yeah. I, he's he's definitely made some changes that I'm enjoying about the team. And he's got the team believing in the new system. I think yeah. the thing about Blashell is that he lost all the trust of that Red Wings team maybe a season before he got let go. Mm. You know, you could tell there were some games where they were just not willing to play to what Jeff wanted. Mm. But, yeah, just, you know, time always tells, right? right. Huh. Do you think, um, like, uh, so just scale of 1 to 10, I know you said you like him. Uh, 10 being the was so far, just, uh, I know, it's like, just, I know he hasn't very competitive, you know, this, you know, just, uh, okay. still very early. Just, um, you know, just uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they go moving forward. Just, but like I said, I do trust if any franchise I trust is them. Yeah. They, they, like, I understand, you know, just uh, people, oh, you live it in the past. I'm not just saying, but when you've dominated yeah. much of the history, only that's been more dom- the only team that's been more dominant historically the Canadians. Yeah. So just, um, pretty much. Just, uh, this, they, I think they doubled the championships because you know, I think uh, Detroit has 11. The Montreal Canadians like, have. Montreal Canadiens have 27 Stanley Cups in their history. Right. The Leafs have 13, fun fact. And yeah. The Red Wings have 11. Yeah. So despite having two more, it's just based on recency it alone. Would, would. The Red Wings have been more historically, you know, successful than the Toronto Maple Leafs have. Yeah. And they're, and their their dominance has been more spread out throughout time in comparison to uh, the Leafs. Yeah. So just yeah. like uh, outside of Canadians, just uh, if it's anybody, I trust them. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. You know, uh, one thing, my favorite thing to talk about ever is that 2002 Stanley Cup winning team. Yeah. Because currently there are eight players on that team in the Hall of Fame. It, like, this is what, what I do. How did you, man, it, it's, I don't know, it's one of those things where, you know what, like, I will say this. Any, any of the four major sports, the one thing I always notice is that everyone always expects Detroit to be the rebound guys. Like, they're going to make that comeback one day. You know, we're seeing that. I would not say we're seeing that with the Tigers right now because if anything, they've regressed. But that's okay. The Tigers are in a really weird spot. Um, you look at the Pistons. You know, we got we got Cade Cunningham. He's out on injury, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We got him. We got Jalen Duran. We've got um, Sadiq Bay, Isaiah Stewart. You know, uh, chances are we they might be tanking for Victor Wembanyama. That, that listen, you know, <laughs> that's the sweet six. <laughs> that's a whole, that's a whole other topic. But like you know, Detroit has always been that city that people have looked at, not just in the sport, but I think just in in the aspect of reality, that they're always going to make a comeback. Yeah, you know, it's something, it's something I believed in a lot, having my family from Michigan and you know, living there on now for a number of years was. You know, we're always going to get knocked down, but we're going to find a way back up. I think, hey, you know what, man? Just didn't, just going back to it, I think Dan Campbell fits that perfectly for us. You know, yeah. you knock us down, we're going to get back up, we're going to bite your kneecap off. You knock us down again, that's fine. We're going to get back up, we're going to bite your other kneecap. Yeah. No, I, because there's always fight in us. We're and I think, find a way. And like, absolutely. And that's what I love about, you know, a coach like that for like a, t- a franchise. Who once upon a time, you know, you know, in the fifties, they were one of the better oh, dynasties, yeah. but just uh, in the Super Bowl era, just hasn't been quite the same. Just when you have a coach like that to really reinvigorate, just revitalize that franchise, it's such a luxury. Like just, yeah. but he, but it's a cherry on top with the discipline, you know. Just like absolutely, man, I know, I, I know, I keep bringing up the past with Jim Schwartz, but it's just, a, it's such a massive difference. Yeah. It just, it, it's such a difference, such a difference. Yeah. I think you know there's a time and place for everything, but um, we're we're getting to a point where Detroit is finally getting some respect yeah. on their name by the teams. One of my favorite things uh, I should have I wish I mentioned this during when we were talking about football, but um, yeah, this one. Yeah. One of my one of my favorite things I think I've heard in the last month and a half is uh, from ESPN, and a lot of people on ESPN have been talking about them. They've been talking about them on First Take. Mina Kimes has been talking about them a lot, and I love Mina. She's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people were saying going into the last couple weeks of the season for the playoffs, you know, because things are still uncertain with the Seahawks and everything, right? Um, the 49ers, when the Seahawks clinched to make playoffs and knock Detroit out, a lot of people had said the 49ers – better be lucky they didn't get the Lions. A lot of NFC oh, teams man, oh, better man. pray that the Lions aren't in the playoffs this year. Because yeah. th- this year, they've been the most coin flip, we will beat the ever living crap out of you if we really need to, team. And you know, well, like, man, yeah. to get national coverage like that, to be talked about, like, yeah, a team that didn't make the playoffs is the ter- most terrifying team in the NFC. This, I mean, but and it's for good reason. It's exactly, it's good. For, it's for good reason. And I think you know, it's it's that sense of pride that we have for not only the team but also for the city. You know, it's one thing I've realized about being a Detroit sports fan for so long, and I see the same thing. I lived in Boston for a, a number of years when I was in college, and I saw the same thing there, man. Right. It's pride for that city, not just for the teams. It's pride for the city. I saw. I was fortunate enough living in Boston for the few years I was there to see two Super Bowl wins and a Red, and a World Series win. Yeah. That that city lives and breathes on their pride for sports. And the same thing rolls in Detroit. Big time. Oh, big time. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. And, like, it's, it's really a way to life. galvanize the, the, uh, the community. Just, uh, oh, yeah. As cliche as that sounds, but as yeah. it's, it's cliche as that sounds, you know, from the bad boys, you know, lines in the 50s, Bad boys, you know, bad just boys, so much, so much rich history. Proud, proud for, 
a proud city, a proud region of that country. Absolutely. It was just, um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, well, man, I just, I appreciate your time as always, man. Just, uh, it's been, oh, of course. but just, uh, I hope this, I hope they make the playoffs next year. I don't want to, I don't want Fingers them to wait to man. make it. Fingers crossed, man. Look, just, we, we got, we're going to hope so. We just going <laughs> to, like, cause I, I would love it. What? I, uh, baby steps. Next step is, uh, the draft. I think we've got the fifth overall pick. Whatever the Rams finished, whatever they finished, we've got that pick. Because mm-hmm. we got that in the golf trade. Right, right. So, um, hey, man, Brad Holmes has been doing magic so far. Let's see if he can go three in a row. I think he will. I think just uh, he's off a good good start, man. It's, it's going to be a good forum. Just for that That's franchise, bad. I'm excited. Um, you know, yeah, it's only only looking up from here. I, hey, man, you know what I'm going to say? I, I appreciate you having me on. Oh yeah, I really do. I uh, I love your videos, bro. <laughs> I'm gonna say that. <laughs> you know what? For a guy that um, I dropped my time on something. Oh yeah, take time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for a guy like me who is a you know, has a profession outside of, of sports is his main thing, but my love of sports just kept me going through the last few years and whatnot, and got me out of some really tough places and some tough times. Right. Um. You know, when the pandemic was happening and when you know everyone was on TikTok trying to do their own thing, trying to see what they could do, uh, you know, there was you guys, the Daily Intermission podcast, also on TikTok, uh, Lumberland, when they were still a thing. Yeah, yeah. There were all these sports-related content creators making quizzes and everything. That I would feel for me as this gigantic nerd about sports. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I finally have a place where I can be me, you know? And, you know, you're releasing all those uh, those trivia questions and everything that you would do and still do. And there were days where I'd watch those and I'd be like, I could probably ace these if I really think about it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. It's like a lot of your videos I had stitched and, you know, tried my luck at and getting, you know, perfect. Uh, daily intermission, stuff like that. Guess the athlete, get whatever it is, right? right, right. It's been... It's been a really great thing seeing all these creators out there, man, that are doing this. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to let people have their voice. And it gives people, you know, like, like you, like me, uh, this platform to talk about the things they love. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Despite being a professional musician, my YouTube channel now, well, it has a bunch of my, you know, stuff from my shows and whatnot is... I'm starting to turn it into more of a sports channel. You know, I'm focusing a lot on other crazy things. And, um, yeah, you know, actually, how much time we got? Uh, every time you yeah. we get, we got about, mm, we got about five, ten minutes. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think I can tell a story in five, ten minutes. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I think, I think one thing I respect is not only that we have a platform to do this, but another thing I, I so I'm not, I'm not the most religious person out there. Yeah, yeah my, my father's a very religious person. I was, I was raised in a very uh, devout, not devout, but very Muslim family, and at one point uh, lived in a society of Roman Catholics when I was living in Michigan. Right, right. So that idea of, of God was always there, but I was never too intertwined with that because I sort of just believed in my own ideologies of life and one of my own. Right. <clears throat> but I never thought the, you know, I watch guys like you. There's there's a lot of guys out in Toronto that have a very strong faith in God and, and what they do. You know, they let the Holy Father guide them to where they go and, you know, just trust in the Holy Father that he knows the path and, and does that. And the reason I bring this up is because um, over the summer, uh, the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup last year, as we know. And a member of that team is was uh, Nazem Kadri. Who is from London, Ontario, about two and a half hours uh, west of where I'm from. Right. And Nas, I, you know, I've been watching him since 2009 when he got drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs because he not only was a brown hockey player, but he was a Muslim hockey player. Yeah. When when did that ever happen? You know, it's yeah. the first of its kind kind of thing. And for years, I always believed in Nas. I always followed how he was doing it with the Leafs and yada, yada, yada. When he got traded to Colorado, um, I said the day he got traded, 
mark my words, he's going to win a Stanley Cup and prove Toronto wrong. Because Toronto truly took Nas for granted. And Nas, after he got traded, you know, kept talking about believing in himself, his, still his strong faith in Allah and, and in God and everything, right? And you know, keeping on his path. When he won the Stanley Cup with Colorado back in June, um, I, I broke down crying watching that ceremony because mm-hmm. there's a there's a brown Muslim guy yeah, yeah. who looks like me yeah, that is yeah. about to raise the greatest trophy in sports. And um, a couple months later, you know, players get there one day with the Stanley Cup to celebrate, and they bring it to their hometowns, or they bring it to, like, wherever to go celebrate and do whatever with it, right? <clears throat> so I get wind that the Stanley Cup is going to be coming to London, Ontario. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, cool, that'll be that'll be fun. I then find out that for the first time in history, the cup is going to be in front of a mosque. In front of, you know, our place of worship. You know, for Muslims. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, it wasn't the hockey part that caught my eye for me to drive all the way over there. It was more the just the historical context of it, knowing that this is something huge. And so you know, I told my dad, and I was like, hey, we should go. So, you know, we got up bright and early in the morning, drove three hours to London, um, parked down the street from the mosque, and we're starting to see people pile up, crowd up, you know, get ready for uh, the first part of the ceremony for Nazim Qadri. And, you know, the... The mayor of London is there. Uh, the uh, imam or pastor of the mosque was there. And um, a very old, long-time uh, member of that mosque, who is a very old friend of Nas's, was there. And um, I remember telling my dad this after we were we were driving back, but something, something hit me that day, you know? Seeing uh, our pastor, or seeing that pastor speak about how for centuries people that look like us people that sound like us people that resemble us in any way whether it be by culture faith or whatever it might be yeah um we don't we don't belong in in things like that you know we belong Mm -hmm. if something he said was arabs don't belong on the ice they belong on the sand but it's been that strong faith in, in god that has kept all of us going in our lives it's been our faith in the Holy Father that we we understand that he has a plan for all of us, you know? Right. And, you know, we talked about that with Nelson Padre's career. Yeah, he had a lot of bad seasons with Toronto. Not necessarily his fault. It's just, you know, the media kind of really threw a negative spin on the poor guy until they traded him. And then they traded him, and media was like, oh, will he ever live up to that expectation of being, you know, that elite player? He's got a Stanley Cup, you know. Nas, Nas's belief in faith and in God to keep going the way he did um, for all the crap he took in that playoff run en route to the Cup, the death threats, getting thrown a water bottle thrown at him by Jordan Bennington, uh, breaking his thumb right before the Stanley Cup final, and then coming back in Game Four to score that overtime winner. Mm-hmm. God's got a plan for him, man. God's oh. got a plan for us all. It was that yeah, moment. Yeah. I just, I cried a little bit. And I started realizing, like, oh, man, this is way deeper than I thought. It's a beautiful thing. Um, it's genuinely a beautiful thing to see that a sport like hockey, people like people like me can thrive in it. And that we can still keep our faith in our religious beliefs and keep us going despite all the crap that we take you know wow. yeah just like you know one thing I like to say is um, if, you know God when the Lord created you you know just you have a purpose you know if you have a pulse you have a purpose that's yeah so this uh, it is so powerful you know you know you know Jesus redeeming me from my sins you know, just uh, it's um, it's such an overwhelming thing because uh, I don't I don't deserve to be here. I don't right. Just uh, 
you know, really the fact that he had me in mind to sacrifice his son, such a pre the most precious gift. Uh, just so I can speak to you, speak to my 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 brothers away from home. It's it's a beautiful thing. Just and on top of every other thing that I have in this life, just if you would have told me like two years ago, uh, I was going to have like over almost sixty thousand followers on this platform, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have believed you. But it happened so fast, and uh, it's, I'm just so grateful to God for all of you guys. Just. Uh, and I just, it, it is, it is overwhelming, you know, just, um, it's too overwhelming. I'm just so overjoyed with that. So beyond overjoyed. Nah, man, just, um, truly a beautiful thing. Yeah. Just, uh, I appreciate your time on me. You, you, you the bomb. Ah, thank you, you brother. Bomb. I appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing that with me. I really do. Nah. I really do. I just hope you have a blessed night on me. You too, brother. All right, you guys have a blessed night. I was just like, and I'm, I'm gonna send you a message right, right when we get off, brother. But just um, but yeah, you guys take it easy, and uh, you guys have a blessed night. God bless you.